Earlier today, one of our guests talked about the, the need to constantly innovate. Our next guest, though, says that innovation is wrong. Brands don't want it. Uh, he is himself going to demonstrate how to innovate by showing us 111 PowerPoint slides in the next 20 minutes. Please give a warm hand to the head of innovation at Microsoft Advertising, Mr. J.C. Oliver. Thank you. <laughs> well, this will be innovative if I can get through 111, but we'll try our best. Right, okay. Are we all, are we all good out here? Yeah, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. It's the time when you're all feeling a little tired. So I'll try and boost you up with a little bit of innovation. So uh, I just wanted to start by um, uh, obviously passing respects here um, today. It was rather sober and sombering news. Um, and I got this actually off of Google. I know Joanna's on after me, and um, she's been up most of the night trying to, trying to organize this. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic image. And when we talk about innovation, what, you know, one thing, I've been coming to Asia for years. And we always talk about innovation. You guys are always behind, or Asia's always behind. And I, and I, I really don't believe that's the case. Because when we look at it, and, and, and Chuck was talking about this earlier, you know, guys like this, who had a plan through infrastructure, education, and economy, were innovative in their thinking. And the key difference today is that you, in this region, you guys all have the platforms. You all have the tools that we have in Amir and we have in, US, in the US. And it's all in the thinking and how, and how you apply that thinking, which is innovative. So it, it, it's not all about technology. You guys are innovation tigers. I want to see some tiger faces. Jonathan, give me a tiger face down the front. Oh, look, he doesn't want to do it. But you guys are all innovation tigers. And you're all dragon slayers, right? You guys are great dragon slayers. You guys are great innovation tigers. You don't have to worry about not innovating in this, in this region. You guys have already been doing it. So just think about that, tigers and dragon slayers. I like it. So um, if everybody knows this building, this is Terminal 5 in the UK. Everyone put their hands up who knows this building. I'm sure you all do. Yes, you've all tra you all travel. And um, what's interesting about this building is a few years ago, they, uh, they built this. It was 4.2 billion pounds. There's a lot of money. It was high tech, top of the range. Problem was, it was getting darker. And the reason why it was getting darker is because the light bulbs were going out. So some guy said, let's change the light bulbs. And the other guy said, oh, they forgot to find a way of changing the light bulbs in Terminal 5. Because they built this amazing, amazing piece of architecture, but they forgot to come up with a way of changing the light bulbs. So innovation has to be rooted in today if it's not to run off and be worthless. So just think about T5 when you're next going through. The other thing from today um, is Dickie the Third, Richard the Third. Um, he was the... Um, he was a king, and actually, he, he sprung to mind the other day, because the reason why I'm holding the FT is because innovation people do read the FT, you know. Um, I was coming through, as I was traveling here, there's an article in the FT which says, Britons are the people they used to be. What does that mean? The genetic makeup of modern Britain still closely reflects its political and ethnic composition of more than a thousand years ago. Very interesting, I thought. We as humans have not changed in a thousand years. Um, Dicky III was uh, reigning in around about the 14, 1400s. Um, and unfortunately, this is what he looks like today. <laughs> um, he's not, he's not, too, not in too good a shape. And uh, he was discovered in a car park in Leicester. Now, I don't know whether anyone knows where Leicester is. It's not the greatest of places in the UK. If you want to come to the UK, stick down south. That's where we, we tend to. So a lot of the business is done. I know there's probably a few moments here. Um, but they found him in this place. And... Um, they dug him up, and so they've got his skull. What was interesting was that they discovered that, well, they took a look at him and, they, and, 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 all, and all of his features and all the skull, they found that his mouth was very different to our mouths today. So bearing in mind what I just read in the FT, our DNA is the same, so we as humans are the same, but what changed was that technology in the fork, because we always think the technology is digital, but in fact the fork was technology. The fact that we've used the fork and the knife to eat food has actually changed the composition of the way our mouths are. So technology does change us, and innovation does change us in interesting ways, but don't always think that it's all to do with digital, because a mirror or a fork is technology. Or a chopstick in that fact. Right, OK, 111 slides, Mark would say, yes. Um, they call me the machine gun in Germany, because I talk so fast, and I'm going to talk very fast today. Um, in Australia, they also call me the talking beard. Now, 
Without beards, Microsoft would never have got to the success it has got. This is a picture from 1978. Um, you can see everyone is very her suit, apart from this gentleman here. I don't know who he is, someone called Bill Gates. But anyway, we forget about him. But beards are very essential in innovation, so hence the reason I have this new role. But innovation is back on the menu for everybody. Whenever I talk to companies, we've seen it here today, there is innovation across the board. I feel, I feel like it's... It's like eggs when you go to the US. Sunny side up, scrambled, easy over. There's all this different type of innovation now that we can all play with. But essentially, we're all using it, but we're not defining it in the right way. What I see as the key areas are the intersections between, between, all the, between culture, which is at the top, traditional marketing, bottom left, and then bottom right, data and tech. The areas in between these intersections are where the most exciting things happen. Recently, you probably would have read in science that we discovered a new element to the periodic table. That's bizarre, right? We've discovered a new element. The way they did it was they clashed two calcium particles together, and for about 0.000008 of a second, there was a new element created. Fabulous. That's what we have to do here when we look at marketing. We have to look at how we clash the chemicals together between culture and traditional marketing and data and tech, because that's where the interesting stuff happens. And the sweet spot in the middle is where the real innovation happens. So you have to focus on those intersections as being innovative. There have been three waves of innovation over the years. In the 1970s, in the 1990s, and today. And the one today is the most interesting. The one in the 70s was all based around efficiency. So it was things like, if you're an accountant, you had a program that could organize your data in interesting ways. If you're a graphic designer, you had basic CAD, that type of stuff. Then in the 1990s, we got the internet. We all know the internet. We're all familiar with that. Um, it changed the way global companies could operate. So someone in Leicester, <laughs> Uh, we bring Lester back in, uh, could sell goods to someone in Auckland or someone in Hong Kong or somewhere in Singapore. It was a level playing field, effectively. And it changed the value chain in a number of ways. The interesting wave of innovation that we're going through now is what we call the Internet of Things. And we call it the Internet, the Internet of Everything. It's a very strange term. What it basically means is that everything we do is now a data signal. So we, got all where, we talk about wearables, we've got all these data signals. It's very interesting, but essentially, all products are being miniaturized down. They now can connect to the web anywhere and everywhere. Now, the key here, the reason why this is different is because this is the first time in the wave of innovation that the, the like, actual products are changing. It used to be the value chain that had changed, now products are actually changing. So it's the, it's the biggest change we've got, and it's going to revolutionize everything. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that today, but we are in the most interesting wave of innovation right now, right here. Does anyone know what this is? OK, good. I'm going to claim it as mine. This is JC Oliver's hype cycle. Um, and so the hype cycle is um, exactly what you're showing on here. Basically, when technology comes out and innovation comes out, we get very, very excited. And so you get what you call the tech, at the bottom here you've got the tech trigger, and then we get this huge wave of excitement. And then what happens? It doesn't come to fruition. We can't apply it in the right way. And so what happens is you get this what we call, you get inflated expectation, then you get this trough of disillusionment. So think about it like um, you're at home on a Saturday night and you're supposed to be going out with your best mate, and he phones you up and he says, sorry, I can't go out. That's the trough of disillusionment. You get down to the bottom. And then another friend phones you up, who's probably not as good a friend, and he says, right, we're ready to go out. That's kind of the slope of enlightenment, because then you're, at, you're, you're on your way back out. This is good. And then you get into the plateau, and the night's OK. That's kind of what we go through here. So you think, like, the top of, this, the, top of the peak here is like driverless cars. We're all getting very excited about driverless cars. Google are doing a very good job. I'm very appreciative of that. But what will happen is that it won't come out for about another 10, 20 years. So we're going to get into this trough of, mm, OK, we're still driving the same old cars. Some of you may be driving interesting Teslas. There's some good stuff out there. But essentially, we go into this trough. And then as we come out, if you think about the slope of enlightenment, um, uh, what, what do we call it? Um, payments, uh, touchless payments, contactless payments. That's kind of coming to fruition now. And then if you think about the plateau of productivity, you're thinking about e-commerce, stuff that really works. So I actually flipped this around the other way and thought, what if, like, that's kind of a negative, but if we flip it around the other way, what my role really is to do here is if we're on this plateau, because normalcy, we always feel as though we're on this plateau. We always feel, we always feel like we need, we're, we're, we're in this point where we need to innovate. My job is to look up to that next ridge and get all of you guys up to that next ridge by 
applying some technology, coming up with great ideas. So what turns out to be a little bit of a negative, you can turn into a positive just if you flip it around. OK, so why am I here today and what am I talking about? Innovation is wrong. Why are you saying innovation is wrong, JC? This is, for me, being controversial. Yes, it is, but innovation, when you define it as radical innovation, it has to be wrong in order to be proved right. What do I mean by that? Because if something is right, it's been validated in the past. And if true innovation is true innovation, if it's radical, then, it has to, then there's, can, there can be nothing in the past that has done something like that before. So it has to be wrong in order to be proved right. And this idea came to me because I read a book on a, on a guy who said, I'd rather employ someone who was wrong but interesting rather than right and boring. Think about that. That's, that's quite an interesting hiring policy. <laughs> But I started to think about that's kind of where we are with innovation. Innovation happens to fail most of the time. There's a term that the Hollywood studios use called rolling, a rolling portfolio, where 10 films a year, out of the 10 films, eight will fail, one will break even, and one will be such a runaway success, it will, it will make up for all the others. That's basically what innovation is. And the challenge that you have in Asia is that there's a culture of not being able to fail fast. So I don't think that there's a, a big leap for Asia to get to the point of being truly innovative. It's more of a cultural shift in terms of being able to fail fast. And the reason why brands don't want it is because brands don't like risk, right? No one likes risk. The average CMO is in place for, what, two to three years? And risk is market, executional, and financial. How do you execute on something which you don't want, it to, which you don't want to fail? It's a big, big ask, and a lot of brands don't like doing it. So innovation has to be wrong in order to be right, but brands don't want it because it's too high, it's too high a failure risk. What you have to do is identify what type of innovation you actually want. When you do that, you will, you'll take out the risk. OK, we've talked a lot about this today. Um, marketing and innovation, this is Drucker. He talks a lot about that. Um, they're the two things you need in business. Um, marketing, marketing is very simple, actually. Marketing is, I have a product or a service. I need to tell people about it, and you need to engage. That's it. It's pretty simple. We don't have to worry too much about it. But there is an art and a science. And when you combine the art and science together with, in this intersection at the top between the red and the purple, that's where the interesting stuff happens, as I was saying before. So yes, there's the art, there's the craft within marketing, but also there's the data and tech and there's the science. And then there's the innovation. And what does he mean by innovation? It's this progress forward, the ability to keep on progressing forward. The lady from Diageo just mentioned this, marketing and innovation and the way that they drive forward. So Drucker was right. This guy, Jack Welch, he's another, another, fan, another fan of me. No, I'm a fan of his. I don't know, he might be a fan of me. Um, he also talks about the rate of change. When the rate of change outside is quicker than the rate of change inside, the end is near. I love this term because it talks about, we talk, we've talked a lot of today about the speed of change, certainly in Asia. It's exponential. And so when the rate of change outside, what I call outside the castle and inside the castle, when the rate of change outside is much quicker than the rate of change inside, you have to start thinking whether you are on the pulse, whether you're delivering what you should deliver. And if you take a look at this, this is from HBR. This is along the uh, y-axis, you've got a demand uncertainty. That's the amount of revenue volatility and turnover that companies potentially face. And then on the x-axis down below, you've got the amount of um, revenue people put into R&D. So Microsoft and Google and IBM, we all put about $10 billion into R&D. We do a lot of that. But you can see here on the graph, so on the left-hand side, restaurants, hotel, retail, potential high volatility, but very low in terms of how much innovation they have to put together. In the top right, obviously, you think computers, software, mobile phones. We all know about mobile phones. As soon as you buy your mobile phone, it's out of date. There's a huge turnover of innovation within these areas. Medical equipment. Who knew? Is anyone here from a medical equipment company? Anyone? No, who knew that was like one of the most innovative spaces? You're looking at each other going, are you in medical equipment? So that's one of the most interesting here. Control equipment, I don't know what half of these are. But the point is, high volatility, when you get into R&D, you have to be innovating. Otherwise, you fall behind. And the first thing that Satya, our new CEO, said when he came on stage in Seattle was, our industry does not respect tradition, it only respects innovation. I think it's a really interesting point when you're in the software field or the technology field, and we're all becoming software and technology companies. You have to be innovating because your consumer does not respect tradition. And if you're a number two or a number three in the marketplace today, if you innovate, you can become number one again tomorrow because no one cares what's happened in the past. You can't look back, you have to look forward. 
So I've got this little theory. There's another guy within Microsoft. I call him the other Bill. There's one Bill, Bill Gates, but I call this one the other Bill. Always important. Um, you know, we, capitalism has always been based on the fact that, that money was a scarce resource. And Chuck talked about this earlier as well. He, he said, you know, if you've got an idea for a startup, go do it. Because it's easy to do now. There's so many VCs, so many people willing to give you money that it's no longer a scarce resource. So in order to do that, you have to be authentic. You have to go out and create this. And I say, uh, my term is you've got to be cool to be cool. You have to be authentic. If you've got something and you're going to be innovative, go out and do it. Because what it does is it puts innovation as your superconductor. And if innovation is at the heart and becomes your superconductor, what, what does it, superconductors transfer energy? And when you start to get energy and you trans, because you can't create energy. If you go back to your physics lessons, you always remember someone said, there's only a finite amount of energy in the world. There is. You can't create any energy. You can only transfer energy. And so what you do when, you, when, when people buy startups into their companies, they're buying in energy, right? Because a lot of the time, the culture takes over. That's a whole other story. But essentially, you're buying in energy. And what companies today fail to do, fail to do, is they fail to drive enough energy into their companies. And energy supersedes intelligence every time. A lot, of, a lot of, we talk about a lot of data. We're always, we're very intelligent. We're almost over-intelligent with data now. We've got so much of it. What, what a lot of companies lack is energy. And what energy does is drive creativity, and creativity drives innovation. And that drives creativity, which drives more energy, and you can see where this story goes. But we lack energy. One thing I see in Asia is a huge amount of energy. That is one thing this region has. And if you drive creative and you drive innovation, you're on the road to prosperity and success. The three areas that Satya talks about internally are the, what we call the three Cs. Have you got the right concepts? Have you got the right products? Have you got the right capabilities? And have you got the right culture? And if you don't have the right creative culture, you cannot be innovative. So a lot of companies I go to are very staid. And there's a couple of things you need for a creative culture. You need creative abrasion, the ability to have opposing thoughts within your organization. People always say, oh, God, we always need people to be on the same page. Not at all. You need that friction within an organization in order to have success and have a creative culture. The second one is tension. You have to be able to take those opposing thoughts and come up with one idea and a purpose. Someone else, someone else talked earlier about purpose. A purpose to move forward. That's essential. And then we talk about agility, the ability to test and learn, iterate, and get things out there. That gives you a creative culture. And without that, you cannot innovate. So I came up with an equation for innovation, and I'm going to skip through this because we haven't got a huge amount of time. But we look at taking those insights. You go from having an insight to having an idea to inventing. Inventing is very different to invention because inventing is something you just come up with and then not apply. In innovation is something you have to apply in order, it to, in order for it to be innovation. So you need great insight, which we plus technology. You need intelligent and brave clients. We've got loads of those in the room today, so that's good. And you need to align it with design thinking. So I touched on the thinking piece earlier. Design thinking is very different to having great design. People can have, oh, my app, the app we've got here for FOMA. It's a, it's a world design product. It, it's, got, it's of great design. It's very different to being a great designer of. So you have to start thinking in ways where design principles are at the heart of your thinking, and that's when you start to become innovative. And if you want to go and apply that, you can hashtag on the innovation equation. That's my thing. So feel free. OK, um, I'm going to skip through some of this because we're, 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 we're behind already, and I'm going to be told 111. I'm, I'm skipping through. Um, I call dragon slayers of, di uh, of disruption. You guys are all dragon slayers of disruption. We are also dragon slayers of disruption because Microsoft, or a load of other companies that you can name today have all been disruptors. And disruption is going to happen to your company and this industry regardless. And because the change is getting quicker, it we're being disrupted at a much quicker rate. Um, I use the example of Kodak. Everyone knows this example because Kodak was, went out of business. Do you know what Kodak's doing now? They've come out of bankruptcy. Does anyone, is anyone here from Kodak, by the way, before I um, talk ill of them? Uh, you, who are you? Are you there? Is someone here from Kodak? No. OK, fine. Good. I can talk ill of you. Um, so Kodak, you know what they're doing now? They're, they're, they're creating digital printers. <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether they needed a consultant to come and say, look, we really need to change the way you're doing business. But Kodak are back in business doing digital printers. Fujifilm was the number two um, in the film business, in the actual film business. And so when Kodak went out of business, you would think Fujifilm would also go out of business, because they're a number two. If the number one goes out of business, yep. Yeah. But they started, decided to pivot, and um, as I was coming through uh, the airport yesterday, day before, um, they now create Astolift. Do you know Astolift? Do all you guys all know Astolift? Who uses Astolift? Put your hands up, come on, you can be honest. 
No one you, yes, good. You, and you, good. Only women, and you, yeah, good. I, it's, it's a good product. Astolift is the number one face cream in Asia. And Fujifilm create it. Because they didn't say, oh, what do we need to do? In no, they said, we understand how light comes off of the skin or comes off of film and affects the way that that product is then created. And it's the same way, it's the same with skin. So they pivoted into creating a product that was a face cream. So Fujifilm, are the, it's crazy, but it's innovative. Um, they, their advertising's rubbish, though. <laughs> I mean, look at that. That's terrible. That was in The Economist, actually, going over to my friend who used to work at The Economist with me. Um, yeah, film is our name, but value from innovation. Anyway, we'll talk about that another time. Okay, there's a couple of forms of innovation. There is efficient innovation, which is when you essentially uh, lose people in your business because machines are taking over. We all know about that. I'm not going to talk about that too much. There's iterative innovation, which is what the Japanese call kaizen, small incremental improvements to your products to make them better. Only big corporations can do this, because when you've got a great product and you slowly iterate and make it better, that's where Kaizen really does work. So small companies that come in and disrupt can't iterate smallly on, on a product. They normally have to come in with something that's not that great and try and take over the lower end customers. But iterative innovation is what we all should be doing if you have a product currently in the market. And that's, and that's a very successful way of doing it. The, other, the final one is radical innovation. This is totally transformative, market-making innovation that Again, only big corporations can do because it takes a lot of finance to make happen and it takes a lot of thought and it takes a lot of energy. Because I always say this, the reason why not a lot of people do innovation is because it's bloody hard work, right? It's like, what, I, I, you can have a great idea in the shower, but then it takes so long to put that into production or even just come up with a prototype. So it's the 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, and it really is a pain in the ass to try and put out. It's not easy. It's what I call the long nose of innovation. People go, oh, I've just seen this great product hit the market. That must have happened in the last couple of years. <sighs> no. It normally takes like at least a 10-year process to get to somewhere. So something like artificial intelligence, which when it hits the market, well, it's already here, like companies like ourselves, Google, Baidu, we're already doing it. Artificial intelligence probably exists right now in ways that we haven't even imagined. Excuse the pun. Um, but when it does hit the market and we don't even realize, it's been in production for years. And that's the thing with innovation. So what we tend to do is we tend to, um, we tend to put things into labs, right? So everyone's got a lab, right? We love labs. All you companies have labs. Probably, you know, Diageo's probably got a lab. We've got a lab. Google's got a lab. Bell got labs. Xerox Park, they're the most famous lab in the world. Everyone has labs. Because what we do is we go, innovation, okay, let's put it in a lab and think about how we can take the company forward. And we put them over there. We put them in the corner. They're the guys who don't come up and only have a Diet Coke. Like They come out the ground tw after 23 hours a day. So we put them into the labs. The problem is that you need a space. So the Japanese call this a bayer. And a lot, I see a lot of agencies doing this now, like the war room. Anyone here from Mindshare? Mindshare? Mindshare have got the war room. They're doing that. It's a really, it's a really good, it's a really good um, room at the moment. You need that space. And the Japanese call that a bayer. But the interesting thing is this. Here's how you need to be successful. So. Everybody who is right-handed, please put your right hand in the air. OK, that's good. That's the majority of you. This lady down here, do you know, did you know what I was asking? No, you're busy on your phone. She's, not, she's innovating down there. Right, everyone who's, uh, who's left-handed, put their hands up. OK, much less of you. That's good. Anyone who is ambidextrous, please put both hands in the air. No one. We've got no ambidextricity in this room. OK, Des, down there. Thank you. Yeah, good. Kind of. If anybody doesn't know what that means, it means use of both hands. Um, now, the ambidextrous theory is how you innovate in your company. So most companies get this wrong. The ambidextrous organization creates their lab within, their exi within the business that goes into the same management structure. That's the first point. That's absolutely key. Most of the time, it's just people over in the corner that you don't even know what they do. But in order for innovation to be successful, you have to create an emerging business unit or an innovation lab that goes into the same management structure as your existing business, and it must mirror your existing business. The second key point is you can't fill your visionary innovation lab with people that are working at your company today. Why? Because they're thinking about how to, how to fix the company today. It's what we call performing and transforming. It's very difficult to do. And so you need about 70% of the people in your innovation lab as new innovative thinkers and visionaries. And you need about 30% from the existing business. So going back to my BA point earlier, don't create a building where you can't change the light bulbs. That's what happens if you have an innovation lab which is not connected to the same management structure. And it has been proven that six times out of 10, 
I kind of made that stat up, but it's real about that. About six cats out of 10 prefer the whiskers variety of innovation. That's, that's, that's kind of been proven out. The different models, and here, here's a theory of mine. A lot of businesses base their, base their idea around business strategy at the center. Of course, you have a business. There is your strategy. You have all the, all the other groups around that that make up your business. And brand strategy in traditional comms, which is what we're all in, happens to be off of marketing. OK, that's kind of old thinking. Some businesses have brought brand strategy much closer, and innovation is still part of the R&D department, as you can see down in the bottom left corner. I say scrap that and put everything in the center. So your brand construct and your business construct and your innovation construct have to be totally aligned, and all your groups can sit around the outside. That's fine, as well as your externals. But your frameworks have to all be aligned. Because if they're not, you can come up with the best and the most amazing product in the world, but if you do that, your consumer or your audience, if, if you're not in the innovation framework or as part of your brand framework, they're not going to accept it, unless it's truly transformative and amazing. But I would hasten to add, there's not many truly transformative and amazing products. So you have to align your brand framework with your innovation framework in order for it to work. Now, a lot of brands say, well, I can't be bothered to do that, therefore, you can, you can spin off, and a lot of brands spin off new brands and then create something within an innovation unit. So you can do that. But that is absolutely key, I believe, in order to move forward and be successful. So the three areas here, and we're going to have to move pretty quick, the three areas here that I look at are when, when I think about innovation are the model, the product, and the story. So how do we innovate around model? I'm going to show you an example now of how we've done that. Um, globally, we've got the right products. I'll touch on that just before we go. And the story, how we create that story to sell into you guys. So each of those, that marketing story, at each of these stages, the model, the product, and the story have to be innovative in order to be successful. So I just recently worked on a, on a campaign with Virgin Atlantic um, where the interesting thing here was uh, they, they use Office 365, uh, which is basically Outlook in the cloud. Um, and so we went and started talking to them. And what was interesting here was they said, how can you help us like, use data and platforms to come up with new ways of engaging our audience? And so they, I said, <laughs> I took a couple of architects from the IT side of the business. So this was quite new. So I'm in marketing, took some of the IT guys with me, and we had a couple of sessions whereby we had the head of brand experience, the head of customer experience, the head of IT, the head of cabin crew. We all got in a room together, and we started envisioning what we wanted to do. So they came up with the concepts, and basically I said, you know what you've got to do? I've got to fly around the world first class on your planes in order to understand your brand. <laughs> and they went, what a great idea. So they flew me to New York first class, which was fabulous, and they flew me to Shanghai first class. It was really good fun. Um, and then I came back and I said, let's start again. No, I didn't. What we came up with was this thing called coping strategies. So we started to look at people on flights and what they did. And essentially, what it comes down to is when you fly, you're coping with getting to the other end. No one really likes flying. Anyone that says they do, I call bullshit on, because you don't like flying. No one really likes traveling. And what you do is you do all this different stuff that we, 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 we put out around here. But really what we wanted to find out was how people are using devices. So the irony is people up in first and business normally have their own devices but have the best screens, right? And so they get all the best movies. It's all high fidelity. People up the back, they're all desperate to like, oh, God, we've got to get to, we've got to, get to our destination. And they're actually the ones that are using the product rather than their own devices. So anyway, there was a couple of things I wanted to work on. And so I came up with this idea whilst we were coming through all this. I said, why don't we create a secret cinema experience? Do you know secret cinema? It's like a live experience where actors come in and you're, you're totally immersed into the whole experience. Why don't we create one of those on a flight? And they went, what a great idea. And I thought, right, let's, we've, got, we've actually got to do this now. And I had five weeks to do it. And they said, well, let's not do secret cinema. Let's have Santa Claus land on our Dreamliner flight from London to Boston. You've got, five, you've got six weeks. Go do it. So anyway, I went up, I went up, in, uh, I went up on the plane, went around on some test flights. On these test flights, by the way, if you ever go up on a test flight on a plane, you're not allowed to get off for 12 hours. <laughs> if anyone, just, just in case someone asks you on a test flight. Um, they, fly, they, fly, they flew around the UK. So we tested out the camera, first of all, um, and we realized we could project. So that was good. Then I decamped from London, Victoria, which is where our office is. I decamped to Gatwick every day. We had an office down in Virgin's uh, lab, lair, whatever you want to call it. It was very cold. Um, and then we, sort of, we started scanning out our ideas. So we had, we had people come in, so designers, UX designers. We scanned out all our ideas. Um, then we had to shoot this, this projection. You can see me waving fake snow around there. Because Santa Claus was going to land on the flight and walk back across the roof, we were projecting onto the ceiling. 
So we had to shoot him through a piece of glass. So um, we had to get Santa, as you can see on the left. It's not really Santa, in case anyone was worried. Um, and we had reindeers looking in, etc. Then we went down there. So we were, we, we were shooting. We, 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 we entered into this sort of agile, what we call wagile framework. So I won't go into that too much. But across the top, you've got all of your different customer touch points. It becomes really interesting, actually, when you really start to break down human-centric design modeling. So what your customer does at every point along the way, how they use your device, where they use it, et cetera. And so as you move along, it's very interesting to see, and, and it's, it's amazing how difference you see from a customer's perspective and how you see from a brand. Then down the end, we've got all of our touch points, et cetera. So over time, we did all this. We had to test on the plate. We created a new scent. So we wanted to create the first 5D experience in flight. So, so seeing, smelling, touching, and movement. I'm not really allowed to say this, but the actual the movement was the pilot. The pilot does this what's called a tip, a tip wink, a wing tip. He actually moves the plane slightly. They're allowed to do that if they're drunk. Um, and so, uh, so he did that. So that was a little bit scary. So we created this whole thing, and I'll jump through here. But essentially, we gave people when they got on the flight, they had no idea what was going to happen. We gave them a tablet, which they got to keep for free. So that was a nice little present. And when they got on, they could interact with Santa. So we sponsored, Microsoft sponsored NORAD, which is where Santa flies. And, um, and so you could interact with Santa. Um, we pretended Santa was flying and was talking to people. So the kids loved it. It was really good. Um, you can see this is the app we created, the web app. Um, and we went through, and it was, it, basically it was amazing. Um, there's Santa walking, walking across the top of the plane. And it was an amazing experience. And look, the long story short here, because I'm going to be, I'm gonna be told to jump off the stage in a moment, was that we got a huge amount of, of Christmas cheer from it. Hundred, over 125,000 posts. It was fantastic. And what's happened after this was essentially the, um, the guys at Virgin have said, look, can you come and revolutionize the way that we do business? In fact, this one's an interesting one. When people started engaging with the tablet on the plane, you start to see this viral effect. Um, and these are the hotspots that, that, as you can see, people engaging with the tablet and engaging with the content that we had on the plane. It was really, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. I'll probably talk about this the, for, a, for a whole 40 minutes. I'm jumping through here. But what they did was they asked us to come back and help them with their marketing and, their, and, and how we're going to apply technology in order to enhance those marketing experiences. So it's been fascinating. And essentially, what we're trying to do is use the cloud as a way of revolutionizing and coming up with great marketing experiences. Because if you use the data and you use the platform and you can solve business challenges, you can come up and create amazing marketing experiences using that data, making it personal to all of your customers. But none of it can really be applied without looking at the cloud and how we're doing all of that business. And there's loads of us that are doing it. Microsoft, Amazon, Google, we're all, we're all in the cloud. So it's all really interesting. The last thing I want to show you before I get chucked off, um, because there's loads of great products, but I don't really want to do a listicle. Um, is, is actually this, uh, is HoloLens. I don't know whether you guys have seen this. This is a new piece of technology we've got, which is glasses. And it basically brings virtual reality uh, within the world that you see. So Oculus Rift, which Facebook bought, is totally immersive. Uh, and we've come up with this thing, which is you don't have to tether um, to anything. This is all built in, and it creates a whole new world. And so I'm just going to play you this last video, uh, which basically shows you where we're going as a company, but where innovation uh, will take you in the next six months. Look around. Technology is all around us. We use it in every aspect of our lives. It enables us to do amazing things. But what if we could go further? What if we could go beyond the screen? Where your digital world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your end? I just put the images in one drive. Perfect. more immersive ways to play. New ways to teach and learn. So put the new trap in the place of the old one. Now what? And tighten here and here. New ways to collaborate and explore the places we've never been. Look at this formation. Let's take a closer look. <clears throat> 
and new ways to create the things we imagine. Because when you change the way you see the world, you can change the world you see. This is Microsoft HoloLens. That's it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, JC Oliver. Thank you. Taking us to the future. The, the only thing I worry about with those uh, HoloLens glasses is not how they project things that aren't there, but how they blank out things that are in which case any parent in this room doesn't have a snowball's hope in hell of ever being listened to by their children again. <laughs> Thank you very much, JC Oliver. Thank you Oliver. very much.